This little light of mine. This little light of mine. This little light of mine. Let it. Everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. <laughs> Audience participation day. That was amazing. And we didn't even practice. My mama taught me that song a long time ago, and she's actually in the building with us today. Can everybody say hi, Mom? I don't remember my mom telling me all about that song, not because she didn't. I just don't remember it at the time, right? I just remember that song. And there was like maybe a hand movement, mom, like this little, I don't know, and won't hide it under a bushel. No, right? All, well, there, there are all these things to it, right? It wasn't until years later that I figured out on my own, in my own journey, that that silly little song that all of you know <laughs> had roots all the way into the teachings of Jesus, right? We're going to talk about that today. I didn't know that. I do now. I also didn't know uh, that song as kind of like nursery rhymey as it is. That song actually was used by the leaders of the civil rights movement in the midst of their struggles as they would move forward. And in the, the situations that I cannot fathom, they would sing that song. In an interview with NPR, Ruth May Harris, one of the original freedom singers, she said this about that song in that interview. She said, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of the bruises, in the midst of the prison cells we didn't belong in, this song was an anchor. It kept us from being afraid. It was one of the things that kept us moving forward. She goes on to say that uh, in the midst of struggle, as their struggle continued, that they would actually adjust the lyrics depending on what the situation that was emerging. And so, uh, depending on the situation, this little light of mine would change to everywhere I go or in my neighbor's house or, or there was a lot of different variations of it. And it got me thinking, like in our time, day and age right now, how would we change the lyrics to kind of match our situation? Talking about letting our light shine. In November of 2024. <laughs> this little light of mine, <laughs> I'm gonna let it shine. No matter what happens on Tuesday, I'm gonna let it shine. When I'm tired and stressed, come on somebody, I'm gonna let it shine. When I'm all alone, when the money coming in doesn't match the money going out, <laughs> I'm going to let it shine. When the Browns lose yet again, I'm going to let it shine. When I'm at my kid's game sitting in the stands and the ref makes the wrong call and I'm about to lose my mind, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Because like, I know some of y'all go crazy at those games. Y'all need Jesus. 
What does it mean for us to shine our light? This little light of mine. To find a strength in our light that is so much bigger than us that no matter what the situation is, big or small, that we have a light that actually prevails no matter what. Jesus talks a lot about this. Jesus, in Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, in Matthew's gospel, we, we capture Jesus' words talking about this little light of mine. If you brought your paper Bibles, you can turn there now. If you're on your Bible app, you can go to Matthew 5. We're in this built series, and at the heart of it is that in Jesus, when we place Jesus at the foundation of our lives, we are built different to be different. Last week, Rachel Hunka, she slayed, right? She, she taught us that we are built different to be what? Salty, right? To be salty. Today, we're going to talk about being built different to shine. Built to shine. Jesus' words, Matthew 5, verse 14. Jesus says, you, not somebody else, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all the world to see so that everyone, come on, everybody say everyone. everyone. Not some people, Chad. Chad thinks it's just for some people. So that everyone will praise our Heavenly Father. There's so much in these three verses. Like I've taught on this so many different times, but to this week as I'm prepping this, what just kept coming to me when it comes to being the light of the world was this word of do you know who you are? Really? Do you know who you are? There's been a lot of you are statements spoken over your life, whether you have caught them or not, they have been spoken over your life. Your, your brain has received them like a sponge. You are. What are some you are statements that have been spoken over you? Some of them are nice. Some of them are not. You're not enough. Oof. What are the you are statements? You are not wanted. You're not beautiful. You're not lovable. <laughs> this was always a good one. <laughs> You're not qualified. <laughs> being in the business that I was in a long time ago, I'd get this one a lot. The you're too, then fill in the blank. You're too old, you're too young, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're too bald. True facts. See, the funny thing about all that is that, yeah, there's words that people speak over our lives, but Jesus doesn't operate the way that the world operates, right? Jesus doesn't see us the way that the world sees us. But do we listen to what he says or what they say? Because the, the, the Lord says that, that he doesn't see things the way the world sees things, that people judge by the outward appearance, the outward, but Jesus doesn't see that. He sees what's on the inside. 
And so to anybody who has had some some kind of you are words spoken over your life that aren't all that great, I want you to know that Jesus sees you. He sees the overlooked. He sees the cast aside. He sees the marginalized. And he says, Jesus says, you are my bride. You are a masterpiece. You are worth dying for. You are not fearful. You're not afraid. You're not. You are strong and courageous. You are purposed and highly favored. You're loved, forgiven, set free. You are worth dying for. You are the light of the world. Do not accept anything less being spoken over you. You are the light of the world, so let your light shine. Don't you dare allow somebody into your life to speak otherwise to you. There's some people that are trying to dim your light to fit in because they'd rather stay in darkness than for you to let your light shine. Listen, don't put up with that nonsense. When people are trying to dim your light, don't dim your light. Offer them sunglasses, baby, because you were made to shine. You are the light of the world. Jesus says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Try as you might, you ain't going to put this light out. Chad Sally came up to me between services because there's some baptisms happening today. I don't know if you know that or not, but there's some people being baptized today. And Chad Sally, he saw something going on and he said, there's the John Tizovich I know. Don't get me hopped up. I don't need any caffeine on a baptism day. I get so excited when I know that people are going to let their light shine for the Lord. A darkness can never extinguish the light of the Father. But let's talk about some things before we go there. Like, I don't know if you know this or not, but there is some darkness in the world. Did you know that? You know you sit in the spit zone. There's some darkness in the world. Now, contrary to popular, popular belief, when I log on to Facebook and some of y'all, y'all need to stop posting because you, you forget that I am friends with you and you post some crazy stuff. OK, I mean, the way that some of y'all post, it, it's like you forgot. Because there's some posts out there like it's the end times and, and this world is all this and all that and all like, come on, man. You've just shown that you don't read your Bible and you don't know world history. Darkness is nothing new. Darkness has been around since the dawn of humanity. It's nothing new. It, it's been around so long that, that our father actually saw the darkness in the world, right? And our father was like, I'm about to do something about that. I know I'll send my son because I love the world so much that I will send him into the world that whoever believes in him won't perish, but they will have eternal life. That I will send my son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save it through him. And that anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. This is the judgment, he says. The light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates light. Right. And tries to avoid it so that their deeds may not be exposed. You know how they try to keep it on the DL. Right. Like they don't want that light around them. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light. So that their works may be shown to be accomplished, not by their own work, not by their own strength, not by their own talents and gifts, but by God. See, when we believe that Jesus is the son of the living God, when we believe that he is our Lord, he is our leader, and we make that decision to place our faith in him, not only have we accepted the light of the world into our lives, Jesus says, now you are the light of the world. Here's why this matters right now. In your row right now, there are people who are silently suffering 
trapped in darkness. And you, you wouldn't notice it, right, by outward appearance, right? Because they got on a cute fit today and they look in fine, and right? They, then they know how to put on that mascara just right and they know how to dress just right and keep the hat down low and they know how to just keep it all neat and tidy, but inside they are trapped in darkness, trapped in despair. People that you work with and see every single day. People in your classrooms that you see every single day. People on the playground that you see every single day. People in your sphere of influence. At your favorite restaurant that you're going to go to right now that now I made you think about. People at your favorite bar at the end of it. The one you know who's always there before you and after you. They're trapped in darkness. Desperate for hope. And they've been praying a desperate prayer. Maybe not even having the, the, the right words to say. They're just desperate for change and desperate for hope and they are praying for you to realize that you are the answer to their prayer because Jesus made you to be the light of the world you to be the answer to their prayer you think Jesus is just gonna like whoop Jesus is back hello here I am like no it's you in the restaurant at the workplace at the bar on the playground it's you have been sent called out to be the light in their world. You are the light of the world. Don't ever dim your light. You never know when someone else may need it. What would it look like to shine your light this week a little brighter, with a little more intentionality Very practically. Maybe like in the checkout line at Target this week. You, you know how like when that person in front of you has got to do four price checks and they, buy, and they grab something that didn't have a tag and you're like, bah, I'm going to take you out right here. I'm on a schedule. Right? What would it look like in that moment instead of like letting the mind go there like I cannot believe that you, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Right? Or at home, when you know you got that one family member who just tap, 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 tap dances on your last nerve, instead of you being like, boy, I, like, this little light of mine, I won't let it. Or, or maybe, it, maybe, it, maybe it's online, on your phone this week. You know, maybe letting your light shine this week is, is instead of engaging into any political conversations or making a comment on someone's political post, instead of spending 20 minutes, because after you write it, then you rewrite it, then you edit it, then you rewrite it, then you pause, and then you hit send, and then you post, and then you wait for someone to comment on your comment, right? You know how you do, right? Instead of doing that, maybe you take back that 20 minutes and you get down onto the floor and play with your kids or play with your dog or engage with your friend or your spouse and say, hey, I see you. I'm with you. How could you let your light shine this week? Maybe, like some folks who are here today, you can let your light shine by choosing to be baptized. Because I'm going to tell you, there's nothing greater than when you make that public declaration of your faith to let your light shine for all the world to see. There's some people who did that last service. I don't know how many people. There was like three people that signed up to be baptized, and then, boy, we didn't get out of that service <laughs> there for so long. And then people just kept coming. I don't know if you saw. I was just walking through here in my bare feet, <laughs> just hanging out. So I'm so excited. There's some people here that they made the decision. They're going to let their light shine by being baptized today. But I'm wondering if there's actually somebody who came here today who had no intentions of being baptized, but actually you are maybe one of the reasons why we all gathered here today. You. Like, you're here, and you're not really sure why you came here today, you know, like, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, sure, that, but whatever reason got you here today, and you've been, you know, something prompted you, and you've been hearing, like, this all about Jesus, and, and you, and me, and we're the light of the world, and Jesus 
like came to the earth to save me, not condemn me. And you're hearing all this stuff and you're like, uh, what, what's going on? Like, and there's just something going on in you right now. And, and, and like, I'm just wondering <laughs> because it, this is what God does. <laughs> I'm wondering if God orchestrated all of this for you. That like 50, 60 years ago, he prompted the hearts of women and men to invest their resources to start a ministry, to then build a, build a building, and, and then hire staff and, and engage volunteers and equip teams and, and do all these things and create a space that he knew years and years and years and later on November 3rd, 2024, you were going to walk into these doors and you needed to, to, to have a safe place to hear a dangerous message of hope and love. And he knew all of that, that you would be right here right now in this moment for you to make a decision to go all in with your faith, to say, I choose Jesus and be baptized. And he wanted a crowd of witnesses to celebrate with you. That sounds a lot like Jesus. That sounds a lot about the stories I read in our Bible. There's this guy, his name's Philip. He was a missionary for the gospel in antiquity. That means a long time ago. And he was in the midst of leading this incredible ministry. I mean, it was just like bursting at the seams in the city of Samaria. And he's doing his thing and the Holy Spirit is, is working through him and there's people being healed. And, and it's this incredible ministry. And right in the midst of this explosion of growth, the Holy Spirit says to Philip, hey, time to leave. I need you to go down this desert road. And that's all he says. <laughs> and he's like, What? And the crazy thing about it is that he doesn't resist. He doesn't make all these excuses of, I couldn't possibly leave this thriving ministry now. Like, no, he does. He leaves because the Holy Spirit said leave. And somebody needs to hear that today because God has been tugging at your heart to make a decision on something. But you're dragging your feet because you haven't figured out all the details you're trying to figure out, like, how's all this going to work out? And so you haven't made the decision that the Holy Spirit has prompted you in? Listen, hear me. Um, the Holy Spirit isn't looking for your outcomes. God's looking for your obedience. And so Philip gets prompted by the Holy Spirit to leave this ministry, and he does. And so he sets out down this desert road. And on this desert road, he just so happens to run into somebody. And that somebody just so happens to be an Ethiopian eunuch who is the right-hand man of, an e of the Ethiopian queen. And so you got this ragtag missionary who meets this high-ranking official in the Ethiopian government. And this official is riding in his carriage from a country that doesn't yet, they haven't been exposed to the gospel yet. And so Philip and this guy get to talking and, ch you know, chewing it up. And it just so happens that right at that moment, the, the Ethiopian was reading some old text about, from the prophet Isaiah. And, and he's like, he's not understanding it, which I don't fault him for because I don't understand a lot of the Old Testament. Hello, somebody. <laughs> There's some crazy stuff in the Old Testament. Right, Casey? Come on. Read your Bible. It's crazy. And so this guy, this Ethiopian eunuch, he doesn't understand what he's reading, and he turns to Philip, and Philip just so happens to be here, and he just so happens to understand what's being talked about. And so he asks him, hey, do you understand these words? And Philip's like, yeah, I do. And so Philip climbs up into the carriage with him, and Philip starts telling him all about the prophet Isaiah and how it all connects to Jesus. And this picks up in Acts 8.35. And so it says, so beginning with that same scripture, because when we interact with people, we should meet them where they are, not wait for them to get to where we are. And he says, beginning with that same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. He tells them all about who Jesus is, how he died for them, how he invites them into new life. And so he says that as they rode along, they came to some water. That's interesting. And the eunuch said to Philip, hey, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? You can, Philip answered, 
if you believe with all your heart. And the eunuch replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so they ordered the carriage to stop, and they, everybody say, went down into the water. They went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Man, I love the Bible. <laughs> this dude, this Ethiopian eunuch, would have been an outcast to all of the religious folks of the day, especially the religious elite. What, first, because like he's not a Jew. Second, because he was dark-skinned and would have immediately been rejected and seen as an outsider from the religious elite. Third, he's a eunuch. And because we got kids in the room, I ain't going to tell you what that means. <laughs> but for Chad, Sally, I'll give you uh, the PG version of it. Being a eunuch means that certain parts of your body are cut off so that you don't pose a threat to serving the queen. And because of that, according to Jewish law, and in the eyes of the religious leaders, our Ethiopian friend would now be cut off from God. You can't get to him. And everybody say, but God. But God. God uses Philip to shine a light so bright to see a man that religion couldn't see. To leave a thriving ministry for one person, a marginalized eunuch from Ethiopia who then gets baptized, who didn't have any plans to get baptized, right? Who didn't take any baptism classes before baptism day. He gets baptized and then he takes the gospel message of Jesus back to his country, back to the royal family, and the gospel then th spreads throughout the entire continent of Africa, all because of one person. And I'm wondering who that one person is today, that you didn't have any business or plans coming here to be baptized today. Well, guess what? God knew and you are. So go ahead and take your shoes off. You're about to get wet. For that one person that's sitting here and the whole time I've been talking, it's like brrr, your heart is just going. That's the Holy Spirit. That's not caffeine. The one person that thinks that God couldn't use you because you're too messed up, you're too broken, you made too many mistakes. If that's you, hey, look, there's water. What's stopping you from being baptized? Really? What's stopping you from being baptized? If you've never made the personal decision to be baptized, really, what's stopping you? Look, there's water. <laughs> How about that? Just before that story about Philip in the book of Acts, there's this guy named Peter, and he's, you know, sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And he invites people into this new relationship with Jesus. And the people are so moved by it. And this is their response, Acts 2, 37. It said, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied to them, each of you must repent of your sins Turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Turn to God and be baptized. Repent. It, it, it's just a fancy religious word, y'all. All right. It means to turn. It means to like I'm heading in this direction and I'm turning and going this direction. <laughs> It means to, to go in a direction and I'm going to turn and give my life to Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this way and I'm, I, I'm leaving the old life behind and I'm starting a new life with Jesus as my Lord and leader. We ask for forgiveness for all the dumb things that we did in our life and then we are baptized. I have a friend who, who came up to me after service and uh, they're going to be baptized at this service. And my man was like, 
I just feel like there's some things in my life that like I haven't been great and I want to do better and I want Jesus to help me. And how old is he? 10 years old. Out of the mouth of babes. If you've never made the personal decision to be baptized, what's stopping you? Here comes the goats, greatest of all time. Right here, there they are. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Leah was like, where do you want the kids? Because we want the kids to be in the room for the baptisms. I said, down front? <laughs> where else would you put them? Jesus says, don't stop the kids from coming to him. Friends, baptism is the moment in your life when you drive a stake in the ground that says, from this moment on, I choose Jesus. It's an external response to an internal decision. Baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to immerse, to be lowered. Baptism by immersion, it paints this beautiful picture of Colossians 2.12 that says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. You were buried with Christ. Everybody always says, why do you always wear black on baptism day? Because I'm going to a funeral. That's why. Our old lives are buried. The old self is buried. The stuff from the past, the pain, the regrets, the mistakes, the, the, the things that we don't want anybody to know about, we don't want anybody to talk about, the stuff that, that holds us back, the pride, the religion, all the junk, it's all buried. And with Christ, we are raised to a new life because you trusted in the holy, the same mighty power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. A lot of people over the years have, have asked me a, a beautiful question, and, and I guarantee you this will resonate with some of you. Over the years, people have asked me, they've said, John, I was baptized as an infant, as a toddler. Does that count? And I love that, right? It's a beautiful question. Does that count? And if you were baptized, as a toddler or as an infant, man, I just want to say I praise God for you having a family that wanted you to have a spiritual foundation in your life. Praise God for that. And it was probably this beautiful moment, right? Where you had family there, mama and grandma and people and aunts and uncles, and, and you probably maybe had on a white little outfit, right? Right? And, and you were you were held up into, into somebody's arms, you know, hey right and a pastor or a priest they like sprinkled your head but I want to ask you something whose decision was it for you to be baptized that day yours whose decision was it like I know this book and I can't find anywhere in this book where it talks about any time a baby being baptized. But what I do find in the book is that we will stand in front of the Lord and give an account for what we did with Jesus. And in that moment, it's not about what was your grandma's faith, what was your mama's faith? What was your aunt's faith? What did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? If you have not made a personal decision to be baptized, look, there's water. What's stopping you from being baptized? I get it. There's a lot of excuses, right? You're all dressed up. 
you looking cute today I don't want to get my clothes wet guess what we got clothes you can change into cool well it, it's kind of chilly out I don't want to like get a, get a cold we got towels you can dry off in. it's a beautiful day you'll be fine it's gonna be 65 <laughs> right you may have a lot of questions you may not have all the answers, right? Guess what? You will never have all the answers. And this was the big aha moment for my father. My dad, ha he still does. He has all these questions about God and faith, right? And he still has lots of questions about God. And, and, and he wants to know everything. And he wants all the answers, right? This is my dad. And, and, but my dad didn't know everything. But he did know one thing. He knew that he believed in his heart that Jesus was the Son of God and he wanted to give his life to him. And so when my dad was 68 years old, I got to baptize him. So whether you're 68, you're eight, 28, you're 98, whether you're up on the worship team, <laughs> whether you came here with the phone to take the pictures of the kid and then you realize, oh, I've never been baptized, I got something going on in me, oh, I feel like I'm, it doesn't matter what's stopping you from being baptized. Look, you say it with me, there's water. Some people have said to me over the years, John, like, I need to get my life together before I can get baptized. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. You don't get cleaned up to take a bath. You take a bath to get cleaned up. So here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna pray. Our team is gonna lead us in a time of worship and response. And at any point in the music, if you wanna let your light shine and make the decision to be baptized today, I invite you to come forward. Head on over to the corner, everybody wave Ellie. There's, there's our team over there. You head over to the corner at any time. If you wanna make that decision, this moment is yours. If you're thinking about being baptized and you're still like, oh, I don't know, I'm worried about, you're worried about your hair, or your appearance, or what others may think, I'll simply leave you with this. When it comes to the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, whose opinion ultimately matters? Let me pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for being on the move. I thank you for how you've already worked today and how you're working in this room right now. Holy Spirit, remove the obstacles and the barriers and the excuses. Have your way with your people today. Go to work on us. Holy Spirit, right now, remove the, the stressors and the weight and, and the things that hold us back. Have your way. Shine your light so bright today, Father. This moment is yours. It's in your name that all God's people say, Amen. I invite you to stand.